coming to you from the beautiful Pacific Northwest in the foothills of the Cascade Mountains, here in the shadow of Mount Hood. Welcome to our home. Headquarters of the American Primate Conservancy, the Chateau de Squatch serves as our headquarters and our base of operation for our research here. Hi, I'm Todd Neese. And this is my lovely wife and research partner, Diane Stocking Neese. It is our honor to introduce to you a true pioneer in Bigfoot research. World War II veteran, adventurer, explorer, great white hunter, and legendary Bigfoot researcher. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our honor to introduce our friend, Mr. Peter Byrne. Welcome to After Hours. My name is Richter. I am your host. Richter! What? Leave him alone! This shit is real. Now we got Richter go and we're gonna have to hear it about it all night. Yeah. <laughs> that's a bunch of screaming memes out there and that's the scoop that has been reported so far. Thanks for dropping me like a snub. I'm not interested in believing in something. Either it's real or it's not. By your opinion that you are no kill, you are dooming the species to be extinct. They are what they are. It doesn't matter what we call them. Let's remove ourselves from them a little bit. And I think that's something that the Bigfoot community can actually learn a little bit from. I actually am trying to push the envelope of science here. When are we going to make a video, Richter? And I mean not an X-rated one. Dr. Todd, you've also been called the scoff dick. <laughs> yeah, well, had these creatures stood against a backdrop of trees, I probably never would have seen them. You can't talk about that. I can't. So you guys are going to bag a Bigfoot and get us a body. We're giving it uh, our best efforts. We thought that we had the holy grail of DNA. Our hero, Bob Gimlin's with us. Hello, is this thing on? Am I muted? Can you hear me? Hey, Richter, I've got a question for you. How does it feel to lose Bigfoot Bounty? Hmm. My question is, why do you think Bigfoot is real? Richter does put a lot of effort into his costuming, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, by effort, if you mean bending over and picking up whatever's on the floor. My. Well, in my opinion, After Hours with Richter is the number one Bigfoot webcast. Uh, what's your name again? Oh. Don't piss Richter off. <laughs> Richter, behave. Hi, my name is Richter. I'm your host for After Hours with Richter. And right now, I'm sitting in the presence of one of the, the legends of Bigfoot, the abominable snowman. He's a Bigfoot author. He's been on three expeditions in the Himalayas. This is Peter Byrne, ladies and gentlemen. And we have a few questions for Peter Byrne. Some time ago, Tom Slick had asked you to come back over to the United States when you were in Nepal to be a part of the Bigfoot project he was working on. It was back in the days of Rene de Hinden and all those people. Yes, that's right. What was the result of um, that when you came back over here? And well, it's not a question of coming back. I'd never been here. Oh, you never been here? No. I was in the Himalaya, mm -hmm. and I was running the last three small expeditions, and I bumped into a group of Sherpas camping high up in the mountains. And one of them was Tenzing Norgay, who climbed um, Everest with um, Sir Edmund Hillary. And um, we were talking about the Yeti. And he said there was an American at my house a few weeks ago talking about a big expedition. And he left his name. So um, when I came back, I was the Himalaya, down through Darjeeling, where Tenzing lived. I went to see his wife, and she had this little piece of paper, Tom Slick, San Antonio, Texas. Actually, care of the Bank of Commerce, San Antonio, Texas. So I wrote to him, and uh, he came out. We did a one month reconnaissance together, and um, came down from the Himalaya after one month, a lot of walking, a lot of areas. And he said, I think there's something there. Let's plan a major expedition. So we did, and it lasted three years. So I was in the Himalaya for three years, coming out at Christmas, maybe three times in three years. Put in a lot of time. Came to an end in December 1959. Walked down to Kathmandu, there was a whole bunch of cables and letters, and there was a cable from Tom Sleep. And he said, um, you've been up there long enough. Um, why would you, wouldn't you like to come to the States and look for something called Bigfoot? And uh, I 
thought, what? So I did. Came over here, got into the Bigfoot thing in January 1960. Put together a project for him up in Northern California, out of Willow Creek, and ran it for nearly two and a half, two and three quarter years until he died in an air crash. Tom died, came to an end. Then I've been, I've been in and out of it since then, across the years, going back to my work at the Nepal, coming over here. So I'm still in it, but not full time. We get hard time. So Tom Slick had you come over here, for, and after the three years of being in the Himalayas, flew over, went to Texas, sat down with him, started looking at maps and maps of the Pacific Northwest, which running from Northern California to Alaska is three times the size of the Himalayan map chain. Mm -hmm. I was very impressed. So I came up here and started a project working for him mm -hmm. all through. Um, 1960, 61, 62. Then he died in October 62. Project came to an end. Yeah. And that was the end of it. So that was my association with Tom Slick. A great man, wonderful person. So. And in the 90s, you had your own Bigfoot project. In the 90s, I had a man on safari in Nepal. Uh, he was from uh, Peoria uh, with his niece and his son. And we're sitting around the campfire talking about the Yeti and Bigfoot, mm -hmm. and he went home, and then I came back, and I got a call from him, and he said, I'm fascinated with uh, the Bigfoot mystery. If I plan a project and pay for it, would you run it for me? So that was 93 for five years, five-year project. It's in 98. Spent a million and a half dollars. Wow. We had a center, we had an office, cars, staff, you know, it really was 24 7. Um, Before the BFRO, there was that. Oh, yes. So, um, came to an end the five years, my contract, and he said, Do you want to go on? And I said, No, I want to go back to, to the law, do some work in conservation. So I did. So you had, you had, you had cars, a million and a half dollars mm -hmm. for five years? Five years, exactly. Five years. Yeah. And then the sponsor asked me if I wanted to go on, and I said, not really, I was very interested in uh, wildlife conservation in Nepal, mm -hmm. and I wanted to get back to that, so I did. So we signed off. So, but a lot of we spent a lot of money, we spent $85,000 analyzing the Patterson film, for instance. Mm -hmm. We spent $100,000 on um, ground sensors and, and um, solar panels for the whole system. That, watching a place in the mountains mm -hmm. with what we call cam trackers now. Right, know, right, right. And, it was, and these were all hand-built, very expensive, mm -hmm. working to a monitor and in our base, things like that. Right. So, so it was an interesting project. And sponsor came out a few times with his family and, and um, a lot of fun. I have found myself over the past few years bouncing between thinking the Patterson-Gimlin film could be real. It's real! And now I've got, I've, I have doubts now, and I, I think it's healthy to question something, especially when we don't have a definite answer, you know? Yes, uh, I agree with you. I, yeah. I, my, my biggest complaint with the Patterson-Gimlin film is that there's a shot of the creature lifting its foot up, and it's a f total flat foot. Just a perfectly flat-shaped foot, the, the, the underside. And I have a copy of the plaster cast, and it's the same. It's very flat-footed. There's the toe indentions. You've seen the, you know, you you've seen the cast more times than I have. And 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 to me, I think of a creature that big and heavy and bulky, in that creek bed, would be leaving deeper impressions. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. You know, I'm not. I'm not Dr. Meldrum. But if that creature was that heavy, it'd be. I think it would be just like it'd be sinking in the sand, the sandy substrate. I don't know. I mean, we weren't there. I wasn't there. I wasn't there. You know? It's hard to... There were people there who saw the footprints. Right. I photographed mm -hmm. some of them. Made plastic casts. They were heavy indentations. John Green. John Green was there. Right. And, um, I can't remember the names here. I think De Hinden might have been down. A fellow called Titmus, who mm -hmm. was a um, taxidermist in Reading. He was there. Yeah. He made casts. And they seem to be quite satisfied with the, the depth of the indentation, do, do as far you, as I recall. Do you think we'll ever have an answer? To what? To Bigfoot? To Patterson-Gimlin film. 
I think we have answers right now that are sufficient to support its authenticity. Right. Not absolutely sure if you were to ask me, I'm like 98% convinced. And part of my conviction is in the integrity of Bob Gindam. He's a man of great integrity. Oh, he's a charming, uh, wonderful man. There. And then I spent a lot of time working in that firm, John Cordell, others, and then we analyzed it, spent a huge amount of money. And then there's a fellow called Munns. Bill Munns, yes. yes. Wrote a great book. Great book. Huge. And everything is positive. Right. That uh, is a real living creature. So. Adam Davies, who's another cryptozoologist who's been in Nepal. Yes. Yeah. Met him here. Thinks that the Bigfoot world needs to just let it go and move on from it and find something else to study. And I think that's a great, I think that's healthy. Yes. You yes. know, yes. learn from everything, learn from it. Yes. There's pros and cons with everything. Yes. So there's a whole new generation happening right now, people out there exploring the Himalayas, Mount Everest, all, all, Bigfoot, big game hunting, which you know something about. Yes. You know, yes. now we have technology, we have thermal cameras that can see in the night. Yes. You know, night vision, that's, yes. it's amazing. Do you think that's going to help, or do you think we're relying too much on technology? I think it's going to help. I think the technology that's available, and that seems to be expanding, is great. And what my hope is, and the many people who have been in it, who have been my peers, is that uh, we find a body that's died of natural causes. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in shooting one, I'm against that. But you were a game hunter. I was a big game hunter. So yes. what was the change? What was the change from going from shooting for game and well, now thinking we should? things. First of all, I gave up hunting and went into wildlife conservation. That's okay. got nothing to do with my feelings about the bigfoot. Right, right. Ever since I started hunting bigfoot, I look upon it as a, a, a harmless big primate, a hominid or hominoid. You no, know, a lot of people say they're gentle. As far as we know, well, from our studies, no one has ever been even threatened in any way by one of these things. Right. No one's even ever been chased. When they throw rocks, they never hit us. Yeah. I've had a rock no thrown at me. No one has ever me. seen one throwing a rock. Right, no, that's true. Rocks. Yeah, I can't say I had a Bigfoot throw a rock at me, that's for sure. It's the same with sounds. No one's ever seen one make a sound, ever. Like the so wood knocking. Wood knocking, but what's making it? Woodpeckers. Yeah. No one has Oaksers. ever seen one make a sound, make yeah. a scream. Right. Wood knocking, nobody. Right, right, right. And there's a lot of... um uncontrolled imagination. People oh, we're in the middle of it now. Misinterpretation of natural phenomena mm -hmm. all the time. Um, Cloaking. Zapping. Did, did so. Rene de Hinden and, and Tom Slick ever talk about those kind of things? Cloaking, zapping, mind speaking? We didn't hear about them in those days. I never heard about screams. We heard about whistling. I remember back. that. I remember reading that, yes. A lot of the whistles, the shrill yeah. whistles. And there's something by a missionary up in Colville, maybe 1875, talking about the Bigfoots coming down out of the mountains to take the salmon from the, 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 um, the Indians' nets. Right. And he said, we always know where they're coming because we can hear them whistling back mm -hmm. and forth. What was his name? Elkanah Walker. Oh, yeah. The Reverend Del Conor Walker. So. so, yeah, there's been a lot of recent additions to the oh, yeah. legend and myth. And I am all about, let's prove it. Let's see the evidence. Back it up. Yeah. You know, and nobody seems to be able to. Yeah. So people hear a scream. Some of the stuff we heard today was definitely bare. Mm -hmm. One fellow had something from the Willowers. Four or five long, sharp calls. Mm -hmm. It's a good coyote. Um, also, I've heard coyotes so many times. Owls make extraordinary times. It sounds extraordinary. So, with the exception of the, the High Sierra sounds, that are Ron Moorhead sounds. They're great. Which we cannot interpret, yeah. we don't know, but the exception of that. The samurai chatter. Yeah. 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 The exception of those, I don't think they make any sounds at all. I think they might be silent.
group that came down to his camp. If he wasn't, um, if he wasn't being hoaxed by someone, and that's possible, not probable, but possible, he could have right. been hoaxed by the people who were there before him, who contacted me, and then I contacted Elberry, and Elberry contacted Ron, and they all got into it. And the people who were there before, strange things. They come in from hunting, they get in their enclosure with their rifles, and they start hearing these sounds. They don't go out to look. They say, what's that? And they sit there with their 30 or 6, 30, 30, still loaded, and they don't go out to have a look. I had this in a letter from them. I still had that letter. And they're kind of odd. So could Ron and his friends have been hoaxed? Yeah, they could have been. Yeah. Somebody could have been up there with loudspeakers, broadcasting sounds, making these sounds. Those sounds can be made. Right, of course. Um, um, now, today, in today's technology, social media, people know where everybody is at the drop of a dime. But back in the day, it would have been a little bit harder for someone to prank them, I think. Today, we could, you know, it's, it's the information is at everybody's fingertips. Yes, that's true. You know? So, uh, Oxford University has a scientist by the name of Dr. Brian Sykes, yes. who has tested alleged Yeti samples from the Himalayas and has come to the conclusion that what he tested, the abominable snowman, is a polar bear hybrid mixed with brown bear. That's ancient. Yes. No, he doesn't say that the snowman is a brown bear or a hybrid. He says that the hairs are... That he tests, okay, yeah. the samples. So where did those hairs come from? Who picked them up? Who found them? I mean, did they pull them off a Yeti? No. I don't know where they came from. Some villager or something mm -hmm. who said, these are Yeti hairs. Where did they come from? I believe Sykes' work, I believe, is thoroughly genuine. He is a scientist. He got sent an awful lot of stuff from this country. Yeah. When he first made an announcement that he would analyze it free. And he got possum and dog and bear and cow and moose and yeah. horse. And, and so he didn't get a single hair that he could not identify. Or that came from Sasquatch. Because there are no hairs. He would say, oh, lots of hairs. Hairs have been found. No, they haven't. There's tissue. There's no tissue. Bones. There's no one. There's nothing. I've been in this now, what, 60 years? There's nothing. Nobody has a single piece of physical evidence of any kind. It's true. That's a cold, hard fact. So his findings don't really change your views on the Yeti and the abominable snowman. No. That's just what, what he tested turned out to be something different. Yes. So the search continues, absolutely. Yes, if there is a search, I don't think there's anybody doing anything in the Himalaya yeah. at this time. Not the odd person going out, spending two weeks or something, flying and flying. Mm -hmm. There's no expeditions. Right, right, right. There's no scientific research, as far as I know. At the moment. At this time. There may be, though. Right. And I think his work, his finding on this uh, hybrid bear, they should follow that up. There should be an expedition. Because even then, that could be a monster. <laughs> a monster bear. We haven't seen it. Could be. We don't know how vicious it could be. Maybe, yeah. So speaking about the abominable snowman and the Yeti, uh, Peter here wrote this book. It's his new book, The Hunt for the Yeti. It's brand new. I'm going to put the link down below for you to be able to purchase it. And tell me about this book here. It's pretty big. It's all talking about your expeditions? Yes, it talks about my small private expeditions. Right, right, right. Which I made when I was living up in North India, working as a tea planter. Okay. I went in three times into the Himalaya, mm -hmm. and then contacted Tom Slick, and uh, we did a reconnaissance together. Mm -hmm. So this book is about those small expeditions of mine leading up to the reconnaissance right. with Tom Slick and a decision to start the major expeditions of the uh, of the 50s, which we did. Right. This is what this book is about. So, wow. so, so. you got a lot of photos in here, too. Yeah, so many photos as I have, so. Well, I can't wait to read, the, can't wait to read this. All right, great. Okay. Right on. So when did you, how long did it take you to write this book? A year. A year, The it Hunt for the Yeti? It takes about a year. Now, is, it, is this like your fourth book? No, this is my 18th. 18? Yes. Oh my gosh. And I've got another one here. I've got a proof copy over there, which is 19th. Then I have a 20th written. And I have a proofreader, proof reading at the moment. So I'm going to come out with 20 books. That's if I last, awesome. If I last another six months. <laughs> you're, going to, you're going to be here for a long time. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, yeah, I, you're, in yeah. Great, you're in great shape. Yeah. Attitude is everything. I've written a book, but not about Bigfoot. <laughs> I like to, though. Yeah, you should. But, I think you have a good attitude. 
You have a good broad mind. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I know a lot of you people out there probably wouldn't agree with that, but Mr. Byrne here thinks I have a good young mind. <laughs> I said a good broad mind. A oh, good broad mind. Which oh. I mean being broad minded yeah. about the whole thing. So. I've told wannabe Bigfooters that not everything's a Bigfoot. Uh, you have to rule out everything first. I know I'm pooping in your parade, but you have to like, was that a bear? Was that a person? Was that a natural thing? You got to, you have to think about that first before you just automatically put the assumption, which so many people do, that it's a Bigfoot. You know, and the rocks that were thrown at me in the Sierras, I didn't see what did it. I can't say it's a Bigfoot. You know? Have you had anything like that happen to you? Rocks being thrown? Have you had no. nothing yet? No. I know you would like to have a sighting. I'd love to have a sighting, yes. Yes. Have you been I, have you been up in the Washington in the woods? I've been everywhere. But lately. What's your what's your recent I'm what's your working, recent escapades uh, looking right for? Right now people? I'm working in the coast range with okay. one partner and with cameras. We have five cameras out. We've had around now four or five years. Right. We check them every two to three weeks. Excellent. Yeah, and we get bear, elk, mountain lion, deer. Um, coyote, hundreds of pictures. Right. So that's what we do. Right. Now you know. Um, that's the limit of my research right Cliff, now. Cliff Barrickman yes. has on his phone yes. a photo that was given to him from an Indian, Native American, from a Native American, an Indian reservation yes. of a Bigfoot, alleged Bigfoot, captured by a trail cam. It's an amazing photo. Have really? you seen it? Has he shown it to you? It's orange in color. It's okay. The way I can best way to describe it, it's running away in a diagonal direction, and it's got a big butt like it's a woman, apple shaped butt, long arms, long arms, and it doesn't look like Patty. The legs are shorter, big bottom, very long arms, and it's and it's colored like an Irish setter. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll text him when I when we're done, or when I get service. There's no service here. Okay. But when he showed me that. It gave me so much hope because it's not being exploited on the internet. Yes. There aren't books being written about it, yes. and people aren't fighting online about it. Yes. It's a photo that was given to him in trust, yes. and he's kept his word. Yes. Okay. Right. But he'll show you the photo, but he's not like displaying it for the whole world to see. Yes. Okay. All right. But it's it's amazing. Yeah. I'd like to see it. Well, it's 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 it gives you that little boost of energy. Yeah. You know, okay. it's enough to keep you going for another 25 years. <laughs> Okay, all right then. Um, I've got to talk. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're going to be talking go, soon. I'm going to go look at some notes. All right, everybody. So, this is Mr. Peter Byrne, his new book, The Hunt for the Yeti. I'm going to suggest you guys go ahead and buy it. The link is down below. Thank you very much for being a part of this interview. My pleasure. And uh, you're one of Todd Neese's heroes. I think you are the only hero of Todd Neese's. Absolutely. Yeah. Matt, folks is what tornadoes are made out of. That's the backside of a big storm that just went over. Hope you enjoyed our interview with Peter Byrne, one of the four horsemen of Bigfooting. Please be sure and subscribe down below and let us know what you think. Later. Camouflage is scientifically proven in the animal kingdom. We see it with lizards, octopuses, you know, granted Sasquatch has hair. It'd be interesting to know how hair can change colors and blend into its environment, but then it's a dark looking creature. And in the forest, the forest is dark. There's shadows, there's browns, there's dark greens, you know, so it naturally blends it, I think, in its environment. See, I was a firm believer of your train of thought, okay? Okay. The big one that I saw that, that really opened my mind, the Bigfoot being there, um, I was looking right at him. He took a step and finished, vanished into open air. He, there was no how cover. How does that happen? You're not so bad. No, don't tell people that. Oh, they okay. need to. They need to fear me. He's a jerk. <laughs> I'm really <laughs> harmless. I don't bite. I might bark, but I don't bite. No, you. You have no. You have no bite. <laughs> <laughs> ooh, ooh! Look, look what MMBRT did to me! <laughs> oh! <laughs> well, people don't demand any proof of the blue bullshit, they just buy into it. You know, believe what you want. Believe what you want, run with it. Find your evidence, get what you're doing. Just don't be a dick. It started to walk in. Into your bedroom? Into our bedroom. It was just big and hairy. From, I'm shaking. It walked in, and then from that point on, 
neither my twin or I can remember a single thing. So you're on this BFRO expedition. Mm -hmm. Was it a Dr. Johnson? My first expedition. Of the dog, was it? Was that it? It was Dr. Johnson. That was when sanity still reigned. It doesn't uh, prove it's a Bigfoot. It just says now it's in a different suspicious category. Or you don't try to explain an unknown with another unknown. They don't need protection. They're doing much better than we are. You didn't. You can't pull it off, Richter. Try it again. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. I'm trying, stop. man. Quit. Stop. <laughs> I think it's very dangerous to profess Bigfoot's a magical being, and I'll tell you why. But Mr. Byrne here thinks I have a good young mind. <laughs> I said a good broad mind. Oh, good broad mind. Yeah. About a year ago, Dr. Jeff Meldrum called what the Bigfoot community perceived to be a hoaxer his colleague, Todd Standing. Oh, yeah. 